Hi and welcome back to my channel. My name is Rosica and this is The Midnight Reader and today we are doing a September wrap-up and despite September being the season of shorties, I am sure this wrap-up will take a little bit of time. I will try to get through them as fast as possible. So I already shared my September shorty TBR in another video which I shall link up here and down there if you're interested in seeing the things I planned on reading or you could just watch the reviews for them now because I read everything I planned on reading. So weird. I had nine books in total on my September shorty shortlist, I guess. Um, here's some of them, which we're gonna go through. And then the rest of them were either read on audiobook or on my library card, or I already gave them away and I no longer own the books. I actually read 11 books. I ran out of things to read and I added two bonus books. Also, you can tell it's October and festive because I put up my ghosts who says boo, and I put on my plague doctor. He's really cute. Book number one is a book I've already reviewed in my August wrap up because turns out I couldn't wait to read it. And that's Days at the Murasaki Bookshop by Satoshi Yagasawa. I saw the synopsis for this, saw the cover and was just like, must read, cannot wait till September. It sounded like the perfect cozy thing that I wanted. It follows 25 year old Takako, who's sort of happily middling her way through life until her long term boyfriend takes her for a meal and kindly announces that he is getting married to another woman that he's been seeing their entire relationship. And oh, yes, she works in her office. Like it's bad. <laughs> also, oddly enough, opening plot of Kate Winslet's struggle in The Holiday, which is one of my very favorite Christmas movies. <laughs> Except Takako, unlike Kate Winslet, does not have Jack Black and Hollywood to make her feel better. So she quickly falls into a deep depression and all she wants to do is sleep. So Q, estranged eccentric uncle, who offers her a rent-free room above his bookshop in the bookselling district of Tokyo if she wants to just help out at the register for like a couple hours a day. I really enjoyed parts of this book. It wound up being like a high three low four. Like it's fine but there's nothing really about it that's gonna stick with me. It had some beautiful passages. I enjoyed a lot of the writing, but my problems with it were like multifaceted. For example, the plot I just described to you essentially covers the first like two to three chapters. And then halfway through the book, we sort of end that whole scenario. And then we're kind of off in a mountain onsen, like trying to discover the secrets of some weird estranged aunt, which is not why I read this book. And I get that this is supposed to be an everyday story. However, I felt like a lot of the dramatic points that we built to wound up being kind of flat. I also just felt like some of the translation was slightly off. Some of the word choices were very strange in the sense that like I'd be really enjoying a passage and then all of a sudden it felt like someone hit me over the head with the, like the wrong word from a thesaurus. I can't tell if this is just not working from the translation, if it's translated directly or if it was just translated poorly. Like some things are gonna read better in a different language and you have to change them slightly. So I don't know, cause I can't read Japanese, but I do know that I read a lot of translated fiction and I feel like there was something kind of off with this translation in general. But some of the writing is genuinely beautiful. So that's why I got so upset when I was kicked out of it. At some point in the past, someone reading this book had felt moved to take a pen and draw a line under those words. It made me happy to think that because I had been moved by that same passage too. I was now connected to that stranger. Another time I happened to find a pressed flower someone had left as a bookmark. As I inhaled the scent of the long ago faded flower, I wondered about the person who had put it there. See, that's delightful. And if the whole book had been like that, this would have been a five star read, but it wasn't. So it's like three and a half to four. Book two, Perks of Being a Wallflower by Stephen or Stefan Chabosky. <laughs> so this is a coming of age novel set in the 1990s. It features our protagonist named Charlie, who is struggling with being introverted, anxious, and a passive character in his own life. He meets two older friends who take him under their wing, Sam, who he immediately develops a crush on, and Patrick, her stepbrother. They're each dealing with their own issues. Patrick is gay in 1999 in high school and in love with a closeted football player. And Sam has had kind of a hard life, but she's trying to make things better for herself and Charlie sort of idolizes her as 
you know, his first love manic pixie dream girl. There's a lot I love about this book, actually. I like that it's written in a series of letters, like Charlie is writing letters to a stranger, and because of that as a narrative framework, you feel slightly disconnected from Charlie, which I appreciate because Charlie feels slightly disconnected from his own life. I like that you can hear this book. As any good kid in the 90s does, he makes mixtapes for his friends, and all the tracks are in here, so you can go to Spotify. You can listen to the mixtapes that Charlie makes for his friends. I love that one of the ways he connects to people is through music and through books because when you're at that young and tender age, finding someone who listens to the same music feels like they just get you. I think pretty much everyone can relate to that, to feeling like if someone understands your music when you're very young, that's like a deep, almost spiritual connection. and something that feels so strong and important when you are a teenager. I think this would have been quite a subversive book for the time it was written. It was written in 1999. Pretty sure it was immediately banned, like by everyone who could try to ban it. I would put this somewhere in like the four star range for me. Like I enjoyed the book. I thought it was well written. I really loved Charlie. I want to give him a deep and lovely hug. I think the reason this is not a five star book for me, and it took me a while to think about it, I'm not in this book actually. And I think for a coming of age story to like be a five star, it has to either be like so captivating in its tale that I can immerse myself completely or I have to see myself slightly in the pains and falls of the characters. And the reality is I was a boring girl from middle class America and my biggest complaints were not sex, drugs, music, a multitude of trauma. My issues were homework and vague romantic interests and trying to do well on the cross-country running team. I think everyone can relate to wanting to have friends. However, the problems these characters face are just not ones that I personally experienced. I find that actually a lot. I definitely don't see myself in a lot of these books. Charlie is listening to the Smiths. I was listening to the Mortal Kombat theme song on repeat probably 900 plus times on my first generation iPod while well, I imagined a highly choreographed James Bond kung fu style action scene taking place on a mountain slope with snowboards where I rescued all of my high school classmates. We have different things going on for us. <laughs> I also watched the movie. I enjoyed it quite a bit. I thought it was interesting that Stephen Chbosky also wrote the screenplay and directed the movie, which I think is kind of unusual for an author to have that kind of creative control over like their work in film. So that was kind of cool to see. I thought the casting was actually wonderful. Charlie's played by Logan Lerman, also known as Percy Jackson. Host Harry Potter Emma Watson is playing Sam. Pre-scandalous Ezra Miller is playing Patrick. And they were perfect for their roles. As any book to movie adaptation, some of the characters and relationships become more shallow because you just have less time to explore them. But the themes of the book really shone through and overall it was an enjoyable film. My only complaint is that I felt like they took Sam and Charlie's relationship down a more traditionally romantic plotline versus how it reads to me in the book, which is more of a unrequited love turned to something deep and strong, but ultimately platonic. Three and a half, four stars. Speaking of coming of age stories, next up, book number three was The Outsiders by S.E. Hinton. This one is set in the 1960s, starring pony boy Curtis in rural Oklahoma. Maybe when I was 19 or 20 and flying solo cross country by myself for some reason, I sat next to an older gentleman on a plane who introduced himself to me as pony boy. And I said, oh, like The Outsiders, a book I had not read. And he got extremely excited. He went into insane detail about how The Outsiders is like the best book of all time and I smiled and nodded and that is why this book has been on my TBR for a long time because I felt like a dumb dumb and I really wanted to read it and I feel like our conversation could have been better had I read it. <laughs> so this book is essentially about class warfare and gang warfare in the 1960s between the have-nots who are the greasers and the haves who are the socias. Also things I didn't know, Essie Hinton? is a girl and I'm not talking down. She was 16 years old when this book was published. So she started writing it when she was like 15. Her publisher suggested using SE as her initials instead of the feminine Susan Eloise because they thought her book would be panned by male book reviewers who wouldn't give it a shot if it was written by a woman. It's a very gritty slice of life story. It feels very real. The whole thing takes place over a couple of days. The things that the kids are dealing with like domestic violence and poverty and lack of opportunity feel very true for the time. Pony Boy lives with his two brothers. His parents have passed away. They live in pretty 
dire circumstances. They protect each other, they're part of the Greasers gang, and all of a sudden Pony Boy finds himself entangled in a fight gone wrong that ends in murder, and he has to deal with the fallout and consequences of that. If you ask me which coming of age story I preferred, I'd probably pick The Outsiders, because even though I don't relate to the struggles they were facing, the adventure story was so gripping that I could kind of just read it like a novel. I also watched the movie for this. It happened to be on the Delta Airlines flight that I was on. It had an absolute stacked cast for the time. Literally the birth of the Brat Pack. You had C. Thomas Howell as Pony Boy, who is brilliant. Rob Lowe is in there. Emilio Estevez, Tom Cruise, baby Tom Cruise, Patrick Swayze, Ralph Macchio, pre-Karate Kid, Diane Lane, and Essie Hinton herself, playing a nurse. It captures the grittiness of the book while holding on to what makes the characters tick. It's a fairly faithful adaptation. If you had to do your book report based off the movie, you'd probably still get an A. I would rate this five stars. It's a highly enjoyable read. Book four is Pet by Akweke Emezi. And I am saying it correctly because I finally looked up how to say it. No points for me, because that's the bare minimum. <laughs> this is a YA fiction fantasy. It follows Jam, who is the main character. She's a transgender girl who has badass main character energy. <laughs> Jam lives essentially in a utopia. There used to be monsters, but the monsters are gone. All this changes, however, when a hideous creature emerges from one of her mother's paintings. Its name is Pet hence the title. And Pet may look like a scary monster, but Pet is actually a monster hunter. And Pet is here because there is a monster loose. So I really like this book. First off, you have a trans black main character where who she is is not the story. She, as the author says, has bigger problems than her gender right now. There's a monster loose in the town. <laughs> she's a hero, not a victim. She is who she is. And she's just a kid hunting a monster who might be hurting one of her friends. This book is kind of all about box busting. Nothing fits nicely into a box. You you have Pet who is monstrous. There's claws, there's hooves, there's no face, eyes, or mouth. But Pet is not a monster. The monster is a person, a person who is hurting another person. So the whole book is kind of written to be like, look at all the ways that people do not fit into boxes. Things that look scary or make us scared can be righteous and good, and people we trust can do monstrous things. I really enjoyed it. It's a captivating little read. I had a little bit of trouble getting into the first chapter just because it did kind of read like far left liberal propaganda, but that lightens up a lot and it just lets the lovely little story breathe. Five stars. Book number five is Ariel by Sylvia Plath. This is a poetry collection published posthumously after the author died of suicide. I have read The Bell Jar and like a lot of her writing, it fixates and obsesses over themes like death, depression, and anger. I, you know, as a new mom also noticed in a lot of her poetry how much she was balking at the constraints of motherhood and marriage and being a lady in general back in the day. <laughs> Overall, it was a little too dark for me to enjoy it very much. To be completely honest with you, I enjoy my poetry more nature-y and funnier. So while I can recognize that this is outstanding writing, it was not particularly for me. A little too dark, but that's just my taste. Two hours later. All right, we had to do tiny human things. We are now back. If possible, the lighting is worse as it is now even darker, more drizzly, and gloomy out. Continuing! Book number six was actually another Japanese translated fiction and one of the bonus books because I felt so claustrophobic about being constrained to this TBR that I decided to just grab a random book from my library shelf and that was Diary of a Void by Emi Yagi. This was a translated fiction that I loved. It follows Miss Shibati, who is a 34-year-old office worker. She had to leave her previous office because of sexual harassment, and now she's in this office where she's the only woman, and all of a sudden she realizes she's being delegated every single menial task. Like, she has to deliver all the food to her co-workers, prepare them coffee, and clean up their dirty dishes in the break room. One ordinary day, she just snaps and says to one of her colleagues, I'm sorry, I can't clean up these coffee cups. They're making me feel nauseous. I'm pregnant. And he goes, oh, of course. <laughs> Except she's not pregnant, but that doesn't really matter to Miss Shibata. <laughs> she's suddenly faced with a world that does not force her to do all these menial tasks, is much kinder and more concerned about her well-being, no longer forced to work mandatory overtime and instead leaves at her standard hours. They want her to eat well and rest. It's such an oddity. It's such an odd little book. It has all the things about Japanese fiction that I love. Whereas this main character, 
never questions whether or not she should be telling this lie. She never questions how far she should take it. Supremely unconcerned with that. Like literally all she does is she's like, mm, okay, so I'm this many weeks. Oh, I should do some core exercises and eat more fish. She just does that. She signs up for like pregnant ladies like exercises and she just continues like through these like weekly milestones of the 40 weeks of pregnancy. Just making sure she's doing everything right. And then at some point, because it's Japanese fiction, the line between what is a lie and what is reality starts to fundamentally blur and the book starts to get really interesting. <laughs> this hit for me as a recently pregnant person, so I really liked how the book was structured. Every chapter is a week of pregnancy. Hot is entertaining, it's very well written. I liked the main character's voice who's just sort of oddly blunt about everything. <laughs> I'd recommend this for fans of Japanese translated fiction as well as feminist takedowns of Japanese office culture. <laughs> the book just sort of strives to answer the question, why do people care about you as a being only whilst you are making another being? <laughs> so why do I have to deal with these people who try to act like they care about me or my pregnancy while well, they ask the most inane prying questions? Why is it up to me to produce answers that please them? And why is the way home so much darker and colder on nights like that? More than that, why is my apartment so dark? <laughs> His name's gonna be Serato. Serato Shibata. Serato with two kanji. The first for sky or air, like out of thin air, and the second for person. There's also a note from the translator at the beginning of the book, which is that the Japanese title for this book is called Kushin Teko, which is supposed to echo Boshi Teko, which means the Maternal and Child Health Handbook, which is a booklet that's issued by Japan's Ministry of Health, Labor, and Welfare to all expectant mo mothers to enable them to chronicle their pregnancy, health and development of the baby, and details of kids' medical visits up until age seven. So the novel's title replaces mother and child with the word empty core, or in the English version, void, which is kind of just, it's one of those details where you're like, ah, oh, that's so good. <laughs> Five stars. I was so enamored with this little book. It's one of those things where like nothing's really happening, but I was just so invested in the nothing. <laughs> Books number seven and eight were some historical nonfiction. No longer have them because I gave them both to my dad. They are Mr. Jefferson and the Giant Moose by Lee Allen Dugathan and Great Inaugural Addresses by James Daly. Mr. Jefferson and the Giant Moose details the prevailing societal thoughts around early colonial times that prominent French naturalists strongly believed that the Americas were deficient in nature. And what they meant by that was that the temperature of the American colonies was too wet. It was like too swampy. <laughs> and because of that, we had an abundance of reptiles, but no large land mammals. And therefore the nature of America itself was deficient. They of course extrapolated these deficiencies and degeneracies to the indigenous population and of course anyone who settled there. Thomas Jefferson, a proud naturalist himself, an ardent Francophile, decided that this was not gonna fly and he saw it as a threat to a fledgling democracy. If everyone believes you're all inferior then you can never have a place in the world stage. So he decided to solve this problem logically by presenting to this prominent French scientist what he decided would be a most gigantic moose. <laughs> Ideally one more than seven feet tall, which he deemed would be a significantly large enough mammal. <laughs> it was a fun historical aside. I learned a lot about French naturalism and philosophy, as well as how that sort of shaped American mythology. It was very short. My only complaint is I wish there was more moose to the story. The moose was honestly about a quarter of the book. <laughs> Could have had more moose. Great Inaugural Addresses was just as described on the title. It is a collection of US pres presidential inaugural addresses with little to no historical context and it's just the speeches themselves. I mean, I did enjoy it. It was in fact quite good. I learned that the founding fathers loved the word bulwark, which I had to look up multiple times. There were some speeches that took me by surprise, but of course Lincoln was by far my favorite. He just blows everybody away in the creaky old president's genre. <laughs> Take for example his closing when he was trying to convince the United States to not fully fracture on the precipice of civil war. I am loath to close. We are not enemies but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of infection. The mystic cords of memory stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land will yet swell the chorus of the Union, when again touched, as surely they will be, 
by the better angels of our nature. That's amazing. <laughs> I'd vote for him. Just saying. Book number nine was The Crucible by Arthur Miller. I read this on audiobook and I highly, highly recommend the audiobook because this is in fact a play. And therefore, if you can find a recording that is a full cast performance of this, it's impeccable. I felt like I was just sitting in a play with my eyes closed, chronicling the Salem witch trials and the hysteria surrounding them. Miller was using the trials to reflect the hysteria that was occurring at the time, which was the communist witch hunts in the McCarthy era. It was dark, it was excellent, it was riveting. Like I said, I love the audiobook. It was sort of fun for me because I've been to Salem. I have been to the memorial of the Salem witch trials. So I have read the names of the people who are telling their stories. People were afraid that they would be caught in, in trouble so they just started lying more and more and then once they were already lying they started taking out petty vengeances as well as like greed over property. It was perhaps not amazing the links that people would go to for power and vengeance. Fun facts about Arthur Miller, he did testify before the House on american Activities Committee and was jailed for not offering up the names of his friends. He also was married to Marilyn Monroe which it has nothing to do with this. I thought that was a cool fact, so now you know too. Five stars. Highly recommend. If I ever have a chance to see it as a play, I will see the play. Book number 10 was Clockwork by Philip Pullman. This is a middle grade dark fantasy. It's incredibly short, so I can't go into the plot too much. It all starts when a writer starts to tell a scary story, but he doesn't know how it ends. It turns out if you do that, the characters start showing up and uh, taking things where they need to go. It stars a desperate apprentice clockmaker, a murderous knight, a rusting prince, a devilish doctor, and a very brave little girl. It's set in a very like German style town, so there's echoes of Grimm's fairy tales in this for sure. It was a nice break from what I was otherwise reading. Four stars. In the last book I read uh, was when I realized I ran out of books and I had a little bit of September left so I looked to see at what at my library was quite short and available and so I picked up 84 Charing Cross Road by Helene Hamp. I was a desperate mood reader and it was desperate times. I've definitely heard the title. I've heard people say they really like it. I thought it was a historical novel. It's actually not. This is a non-fiction book. It's a series of letters written in post-World War II between a very eccentric American scriptwriter Helene Hamp and the employees of a British bookstore located on 84 Charing Cross Road and it's their correspondence over decades. Basically Helene is kind of a book snob and she wants very specific books. She wants these very specific editions. She wants them to be beautiful. She wants them to be gorgeous. She doesn't like cheap American books so she starts ordering them from the bookshop in England because the dollar moves more than the pound at the time. She can get fantastic editions of obscure books for just a few American dollars. She's very eccentric. It was really fun to read like her being like, how dare you send me this edition? <laughs> and the poor long-suffering bookstore employees who are like, madam. But also she's very redeemable as a person because there were a lot of shortages and rationing in post-World War II London. So she would send them things that were cheap for her, but wonderful for them, like eggs and flour and nylon stockings. It was a lovely little snapshot into post-World War II London all the way up until like the rise of the Beatles in the 60s and their friendships which extended over an actual sea and decades. Also highly recommend the audiobook if you can get it because it's so much fun to hear the letters read dramatically. It really works in that format. It was genuinely good like a five star very like warm-hearted read. It was just fun. So those are the books that I read in September. I hope that some of them maybe appeal to you a little bit. My baby is currently yammering so I have to go back and pluck her out of the crib um, and entertain her for a while until she actually goes to bed. So <laughs> thank you all for watching, for liking and subscribing, and I will see you all next video. Bye!